Can we turn to the book of Revelation, please? We're going to read from chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to read the first nine verses and then verse 19. So Revelation 1, verse 1. It says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand john to the seven churches which are in asia uh, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from jesus christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then please, if we could read verse 19, we read this, right? The, the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us as we can contemplate this amazing book. And we want to just start with an introduction to the book of revelation in this session uh, some just some general remarks concerning the book and we want to begin by thinking about the dating of the book of revelation because nothing is more important than this issue uh, it really is a vital issue uh, to understand when was this written now the generally accepted date rests primarily on the early witness of Irenaeus um, or Irenaeus, I don't know how you would say his name, Irenaeus lived in 185. Uh, he stated that the Apostle John saw the revelation while he was on Patmos at the close of Domitian's reign, the Emperor Domitian. Now, we know uh, that the Emperor Domitian, he reigned from AD 81 to AD 96. So, but, so somehow this revelation was given to John during that time frame, A.D. 81 to 96. And many believe uh, Domitian died in 96. John received his revelation pr just prior to that event, the death of Domitian. Uh, and he was returned from exile on the Isle of Patmos to Ephesus, uh, where he ultimately died as an old man in the city of Ephesus. Now, the, there's one other viewpoint held. This is the dominant view is 80, 90, 95, somewhere around there before the death of, uh, or after the death, before the death of Domitian while he's on Patmos. But another viewpoint is because of a statement by a man called Papias, an early church father, said that John actually was martyred prior to AD 70. And so basically, there's there's two kind of dates. One is prior to AD 70, the one is AD 95 uh, or 96. Now, I want to just say this, that um, Papias's quotation is greatly questioned. And the reason for that uh, the very accuracy of his statement that John was martyred before AD 70 is 
statements by other church fathers that confirm the 95 AD date. And so, for instance, um, Clement of Alexandria, uh, Eusebius, all affirm the book was written by John on the Isle of Patmos in AD 95 or 96. Now you say, well, wh why does that make any difference? You know, for a lot of books, it does. How does it matter what when they were written? Well, in this case, it matters a great deal. And the reason it matters a great deal is that those that take the early date view that it was written prior to AD seventy. They believe that everything in the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled in A.D. 70. Now, if John didn't write it to A.D. 96 or 95, then there's no way what he wrote could have already been fulfilled because he's writing it as if it's prophetic and yet to come. And so <clears throat> it's very important to recognize that the overwhelming evidence is that it wasn't written till 95 AD, which means that the book is prophetic. It's not history. You see, if it was written in AD prior to AD 70, it would be a history book. It would be telling you events that had already happened. And, and so uh, there's there are those uh, what we call preterists. Uh, and let me give you some names. Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, would be one of them. Uh, another one is R.C. Sproul, and there are others too, uh, lesser known ones, that believe that the whole book of Revelation was actually fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, and they base it on this earlier date by Papias. But the vast majority of scholars say, no, uh, the overwhelming evidence uh, is that he wrote it on Patmos, uh, where he had been sent, banished by Domitian, and he wrote it uh, probably 95 A.D., which means it's all prophetic and yet future. In fact, if you really want to uh, do some study on this, um, on the, the pretrib.org website, uh, Mark Hitchcock, a, a prophecy scholar, has written his, his doctoral thesis on the dating of the book of Revelation, and he presents overwhelming evidence for an AD 95 writing of this particular book. So we, we say all that because the date is very important. Revelation itself is important too because it's the last inspired book of the Bible to be written, and it's rightly positioned in the New Testament as its final book. It, it's the climax, really, of Revelation, of, of the whole of the, the divine library, if you like. It's, it really is the climax. And what you find is uh, when it comes to Bible commentaries, many have said, actually, the best commentary on Revelation is the entire Bible, because there are streams that begin to flow in Genesis that reach their fulfillment in the book of Revelation. And all through Scripture, you can see these streams continuing to develop and branch out until they reach a climax in the book of Revelation. And so it really is a marvelous book. Now, I want to give you the different ways this book has been viewed by Bible students. And there's four major approaches to the book. Uh, we want to look at the four approaches. I'm going to tell you the approach that I'm going to be taking, which is the futurist viewpoint of the book, which means that I believe that everything is, uh, apart from the, the first three chapters, everything after chapter four is describing events that are yet future. And so I'm going to take what's called the futurist view to the book. Uh, I'm unashamedly premillennial and pre-tribulation. And so I'm going to be looking at it from that perspective. Now, I recognize that maybe those that disagree with me, uh, I know that Revelation is a controversial book. But that's the view that I'm going to be taking. As I'm doing this, the talking, I have the right to pick my view, and I'm going to say I'm going to go premillennial, pre-tribulation. And we can discuss uh, different uh, questions in the Q&A session, but that's the way we're going to approach this book. But let me tell you the different views. First of all, I've already hinted at it, this is what we call the preterist approach. And preterists, uh, they basically say uh, Revelation is a symbolic portrayal of events that took place in the Roman Empire 
during the first century, and it does not deal with actual future events. It was all pretty much fulfilled in AD 70 by the, the destruction of Jerusalem and the basic uh, dispersion of the Jewish people. The, the problem with that, that view is, one, we've already said the date. It wasn't written prior to, to the destruction of AD 70, uh, but also because the book itself talks about itself in terms of being prophecy, not history. And so let's just look at that. Verse 3 of Revelation chapter 1, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy so it's prophetic it's not historical it's pro a prophetic book look at revelation 22 revelation 22 verse 7 behold i come quickly blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book verse 10 and he saith unto me seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book verse 18 and 19 for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add any uh, unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. So I just want you to see that it's a book that claims it itself to be prophecy. And so it's looking forward to events not yet fulfilled, soon will come to pass, but not yet fulfilled at the time of writing. So the preterist approach, I think, can be pretty much substantially dismissed uh, as not being true. Uh, and yet still, there are those, and we've mentioned some of them, that tenaciously hold on to the preterist approach. Another is the historical approach. And again, Revelation is viewed as symbolic of a portrayal of church history from the day of Pentecost till the second coming of Christ. And <clears throat> the problem with the view is um, that they try to show the book of Revelation to be have been fulfilled by various historical events. And as many commentaries as there are that hold this historical approach, they have different opinions about what historical events fulfill the various portrayals in the in the book and so uh, it's 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 very hard to find two that agree on what part of history the given passage refers to and so the historical approach again doesn't really hold much uh, sway with many people because as you read the commentaries they all look at it in a very different way and then there's the allegorical approach this approach revelation is really a collection of stories about the struggle between good and evil and actually has no reference to past or future events. It's just kind of a, a, an allegorical picture of the ongoing struggle between good and evil. And uh, it's mainly those that hold the allegorical approach would be Roman Catholic scholars and also liberal scholars, uh, those that uh, really are the modern day Sadducees. Uh, they would take the allegorical, allegorical approach. And the view that we're going to take, the futuristic approach, is uh, that Revelation, a major portion of the book, is prophetic events that are yet to happen. So a lot of it's going to describe the, the seven-year tribulation period, which is yet to happen. And then that will climax with the second coming of christ and then we'll go into the millennial kingdom christ reigning for a thousand years uh, and then there'll be the great white throne judgment and then we'll go in and we look at uh, the eternal state and i believe it's the only approach that takes seriously revelation's claim to be a prophetic book and so that's the approach that we are going to take. Now, the style of the book of Revelation, as you well know, is very similar to Daniel and Ezekiel in that it uses a lot of symbolic uh, portions, kind of symbolic pictures, and, and apocalyptic, what we call apocalyptic visions. And <clears throat> the fact that it has so many symbols has led to difficulty with interpretation. But what we're going to find as we go through the book is that actually 
many of the symbols that are used in the book of Revelation are used elsewhere in scripture. And so we're going to find that they're not actually that difficult to interpret when we compare scripture with scripture. That's why a knowledge of the entire Bible is a prerequisite to know revelation, because as you look at these various symbols, you have to say, well, where else is a symbol like that? And we're going to do that. So we're going to be going back and forth into the Old Testament, and we're going to be tracing the symbolic uh, pictures in the book and showing them uh, and their connection in the Old Testament. Well, Revelation does not have a, a single direct quotation from the Old Testament. There are hundreds of places where John alludes in one way or another to the Old Testament scripture. Uh, one Bible commentator commentator H.P. Sweet says this, that of the 404 verses of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, 278 of them are allusions to the Old Testament. That's, a, that's quite a percentage, right? Out of, out of 404, 278 of the verses directly allude to Old Testament events or scriptures. So how are we going to look at the book? Well, we're going to see that the, there's three major movements, chapters 1 through 5, chapters 6 through 20, and chapters 20 and 22. Of these three movements, they all end up with Christ enthroned, which is a beautiful thing. Christ is given the, the, the place of being enthroned. He's enthroned in heaven at the end of chapters 1 through 5. So if you look at chapter 5, verse 6, you'll see, for instance, and I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. So right there in the midst of the throne is the lamb. Christ enthroned in heaven. Chapters 6 through 20 are going to climax, uh, in a sense, with Christ enthroned on earth at the, uh, in the millennial reign. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worship the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there he is reigning upon his throne and his martyred saints are going to live and reign with him. So again, he's enthroned on earth. And then in Revelation 20 through 22, the final section, he's enthroned in the new creation. Revelation 22, verse 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And so it's a beautiful book because it's a book that is intent on seeing Christ enthroned in heaven, on the earth, and in the new heavens and the new earth. In each case, we end up with Christ enthroned. And what a delight it is to see this and to consider this. Now, we also are going to notice as we go through the book of Revelation that the scenes in the book of Revelation alternate between heaven and earth. There'll be a vision of heaven. Something will happen. For instance, a seal will be opened in heaven, and there'll be a corresponding event that will take place on the earth. And we're going to, with great rapidity, kind of alternate between the heavenly scene and the seal opening, and then the earthly scene and the events that will take place. And, and so it's, we're going to kind of follow that through the book, alternating scenes between heaven and earth. And the idea is this, that <clears throat> like the Lord's Prayer, where it says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. We all know that that from Luke 11, verse 2. And so what we're going to see is God's will is going to be declared in heaven and will be fulfilled on earth. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it will finally find its answer and its fulfillment. Declaration in heaven, fulfillment 
on the earth. Now, again, just looking at general features of the book, another general feature of the book is that it's a book of sevens. Number seven is very prevalent in the book of Revelation. And so we're going to see throughout the book seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, Re seven stars, Revelation 1, 16, seven golden lampstands, Revelation 1, 12, seven spirits of God. We'll see that, chapter 4, verse 5. Seven seals. Uh, we'll see that throughout chapter 6 and even in chapter 8, various references, verse 1 and verse 3 and verse 5 and so on. Seven trumpets uh, from chapter 8, verse 6, all the way through to chapter 11, verse 15. Seven um, thunders, chapter 10, verse 3. Seven bold judgments um, from Revelation 16, verse 1, all the way to verse 17. Seven major personalities are going to be revealed in chapters 12 through 14. And I'll just mention them. We'll look at them in detail at the time. But I'll just mention these seven major personages. There's going to be a woman. Uh, that woman is actually pictorial or symbolic of Israel. We'll see that. There's going to be a great dragon. There's going to be a man-child who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. There's going to be a beast and a false prophet. There's going to be Michael. And there's going to be the great whore. Seven major personages. And then seven beatitudes. When we, we think of the Beatitudes, generally, those are the statements in Scripture that say, blessed is the man, or blessed are they. And we find them often in the Lord's teaching in Matthew chapter 5, where it's often called the Beatitudes, his sermon. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. But throughout the book of Revelation, there are also seven Beatitudes, seven blesseds. Uh, we, by the way, we find them in the Psalms as well. In fact, the Beatitudes are found in various places. But again, in the book of Revelation, we find seven of them. And I'm going to just take the moment to read them to us uh, so we can make note of them. But as we go through the book, we will pay attention more fully. First one, you don't have to get far into the book. And that is chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And so we're promised a blessing. How incredibly happy are those that read and those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things. So there's the first one. Uh, again, we'll think about what that scripture actually means in context when we get there. But I want you just to see that it clearly is a beatitude. Blessed is he that... And then we find the next one is in chapter 14, Revelation 14 and verse 13, Revelation 14, verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. By the way, just as a general principle, uh, it is a blessing to die in the Lord, isn't it? The alternative is to die without the Lord, and that is not a blessing. Uh, that's a tremendous curse to bless without the Lord. But blessed are those that die in the Lord from this point onwards. Yea, the Spirit says that they will rest from their labors. Chapter 16 and verse 15 is the next beatitude. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. So again, blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garments. Chapter 19 and verse 9. We read this. <clears throat> he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God, what a wonderful thing it will be to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, how blessed would be that person that is invited to be there 
and it's going to be an amazing time. Chapter 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Old I come of the prophecy of this book. Blessed indeed. He says, are they, or is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book? And then chapter 22, verse 14, the final and seventh one. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So what a beautiful set of promises. The blessings, the blessed, how blessed are those. Uh, and so we'll look at each one individually and consider the teaching connected with them as we go through. But I want you just to see that in this book that is replete with sevens, there's just so many of them that run through the book. And of course, how fitting John the Apostle, if you remember uh, in his book, seven signs <laughs> that are given. And, and the number seven runs through the Gospel of John as well. And so how fitting that this book also is filled with sevens. The subject of the book of Revelation is a book of judgment. It's a book of judgment. Of course, we said the style is sim symbolism, but it really is a book of judgment. And Revelation reveals what the judge is like. It, it reveals Christ in his capacity as judge. Uh, the father had said that all judgment had been committed to the son. And we're going to see that, uh, John 5, 22, all judgments given to the Son. And so as we go through the book of Revelation, we're going to have a good glimpse of this. And so what we're going to see is uh, in chapter 1, we get a glimpse of the judge. There's this unveiling of Christ in glory. What does a glorified Christ look like? What does it look like to look into the eyes of the judge? And we're going to see his eyes are like a flaming fire. This is this is what the judge looks like, chapter one. It's kind of an unveiling of Christ in glory as the judge. And then in chapters two and three, because judgment must first begin where? At the house of God. He's walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And what is he doing? He's assessing. He's judging. He's judging the local assemblies of believers. He's seeing things that, that maybe they don't see themselves that have been brought, going to be brought to their attention, showing them areas where they need to repent. And so he's ministering in judgment amongst the seven golden lampstands, the local assemblies of believers. In chapter 4 through 19, we're going to see him judging rebellious mankind. And there's going to be a technical term we're going to come across that's going to describe these rebellious human beings. And that term is going to be the earth dwellers. These are the people that have said, we will not have this man to reign over us. And they think the earth belongs to them, not to him, the earth dwellers. Right. So there's, there's going to be a series of judgments that will be poured out upon the earth dwellers. So rebellious mankind, chapters 4 through 19, will, will feel the ire of the judge. And then chapter 20, the lost of all the ages will finally meet their judge. Uh, there'll be a great white throne, and we'll look at him that sat upon the throne, from whom the earth and the heaven fled away. And, of course, they're going to be face to face with none other than this glorified Christ revealed in chapter one, the lost of all the ages. So once the judge has completed his work of judgment, we'll see the aftermath of his judgments. Those lost ones will be thrown into the lake of fire, and then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, which will be the glorious and eternal dwelling place of Christ and his people. 
And so that's kind of how the book is going to unfold before us. It's certainly a book that has enriched and encouraged the lives of God's people for centuries, and especially believers who are surrounded by trouble and by persecution. And so it really is a, an amazing book. As we embark on our journey through the book of Revelation, uh, we're promised, as we've said, a blessing. Blessed are those. Uh, it's interesting that it's the only book in the New Testament that promises a blessing to those that read it and those uh, that he hear it and those that actually uh, keep it, keep the words of this prophecy. And so it's, we're in, we really are in for a blessing. I suppose we might ask the question, how do we keep it? <laughs> well, I, I would say this, that one of the, the ways that a, a believer keeps the words of this prophecy is this, that even though these are future events, in one sense, the spirit of Antichrist is present in every age. And if you look at First John, just for a second, chapter 2, first epistle of John, chapter 2, and verse 18, John the Apostle makes this remarkable statement he says little children it is the last time and as you have heard that antichrist shall come that's the future antichrist he's going to be writing about in this book the book of revelation but he says there is a time that he will come but even now are there many antichrists whereby whereby we know that it is the last time so what we could say is the antichrist spirit is already out in the world and so in the book of revelation it's a question of loyalty isn't it it's loyalty to christ when the kingdom of antichrist is on the earth and so we might say that how do we keep it we're going to be blessed by reading it uh, we certainly are going to experience a blessing in doing that uh, by hearing it by by reading it but at the same time those that keep it are those that remain loyal to Christ in a day, the last days, where the spirit of Antichrist is clearly at work in this world. And it really is even in the day we find ourselves in. And so it's a book about loyalty to Christ. Now, one of the nice things about the book of Revelation is that it actually gives us an outline embedded in the text. And it's, I think that's very helpful. I really do. And uh, we, we find it in chapter 1 and verse 19. And that's why we read from this verse. He says, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So there's, there's three different sections to the book. One, John is to write the things which you've seen. The second, the things which are. The third, the things which shall be hereafter. And it's kind of helpful because he tells us very clearly when the things that are hereafter are going to begin. But let's think about the things which you have seen. And I believe that what's in view is chapter one. The things that thou hast seen is he is to record for us the reality of the resurrected and glorified Christ. What did he see? <laughs> He was in the spirit in the Lord's day, on the Lord's day, and he was given a revelation of Christ glorified. And so he's going he's gonna to describe for us the things which thou hast seen in chapter one, the reality of the resurrected and glorified Jesus. As we've already said, a look at the judge, the one who's going to be exercising judgment throughout this book. And the things which are would be the church's that are described for us in revelation chapter two and three jesus gives seven messages to seven churches and we're going to see that there's a lot more to that than just the original letters to those seven churches but but it really is a description of the things which are the the, the present conditions and then when he talks about the things which are hereafter we don't need to be uh, confused about what is in view here, because if you look at chapter 4, verse 1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, 
And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Okay, so clearly the things which shall be hereafter is described for us from chapter four onwards through the remainder of the book. So that's how we're going to divide the book up, just in that exact same way. We're going to look at chapter one, the things that you have seen, the glorified Christ. And what a great way to start the book, to get a glimpse of the glorified Christ. And then chapter two and three, the things which are the state of the seven churches, and then the things which shall be hereafter. We're going to see uh, the beautiful heavenly scene, which is so critical to understanding the rest of the book. Uh, we're going to see the tribulation we're going to see the second coming of the lord jesus we're going to see the millennial kingdom we're going to see the new heavens and the new earth now just a, a quick note on the authorship of the book we've already dealt with the dates of it but uh, again we want to just deal with the issue of the author of the book now again it's not difficult because uh, we're told very directly who this writer is his name is given clearly. Uh, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be to you and peace. Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 21 and verse 2. I, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband chapter 22 and verse 8 and i john saw these things and heard them when i had heard and seen i fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things then saith he unto me see thou do it not for i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book worship god so what we can see is that the writer is john he's exiled to the isle of patmos he's exiled to the isle of patmos for the word of god and for the testimony of jesus and so again it would seem pretty clear that this is none other than john the apostle uh, the author's use of the old testament as we've said 278 out of 404 verses uh, shows that this man really knew the book he knew the old testament well there's great tabernacle references that we'll consider and temple ritual uh, displayed in this book and he knew this and he knew it all well he's he's intimately known to the churches of asia they know who he is and so it, it, again we we have no doubt in our minds that it is john the apostle in fact um uh, one of the uh the interesting things is that um, uh, one of the closest people uh, in terms of date uh, to, to John was a man called Justin Martyr, who lived from 100 to 165. He lived in Ephesus within one generation of John, and he gives unquestionable testimony to John the Apostle as writer. And this is what, what, he, what he says. <clears throat> um, and also another one, Arrhenius, very similar, 175 to 195, a native of Smyrna who listened to Polycarp, a disciple of John. They all give the same testimony. They all say without question that it was John the Apostle who was on Patmos for the word of God who wrote this epistle. In 1945, a recent discovery also gave like testimony a papyrus document from Egypt dated in 150 
So 150, if Revelation is written in 95, this uh, document, this papyrus document from Egypt dated 150, quotes Revelation 119, you know, the verse we've just looked at, the things that you have seen, the things that are, the things that shall shortly come hereafter, and then claimed that this was written by John, the brother of James, these who were the sons of Zebedee. Many other writers, amongst whom are Clement of Alexandria, Origen, all testify to the fact that John is the accepted human author of the book of Revelation. So that's good for kind of some preliminary thoughts on the book. Now, I want to just uh, think about the very opening statement in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation is a very critical word, and it means unveiling. And that's the, the emphasis of this book. It's, it's an unveiling. And what is it an unveiling of? We tend to think of it in terms of, oh, well, it's it's pulling back the curtain and giving us a look at the end times. And we're going to get to see the uh, the revelation of the Antichrist. And we're going to get to see, you know, kind of the, the last days and what the tribulation is going to be like. And actually, uh, that's not what it says. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And so I want us to just emphasize that, that as we go through this book, it is the emphasis is primarily Christological rather than eschatology. It wants to show us something of the glory of Christ. Now, of course, we're going to be looking at eschatology, but we don't want to miss the glory of Christ as we go through this book. Another thing to just state about this book and I find this a very encouraging thing, that there's a word that is used here, 15 out of the 28 references in the entire Bible, and the word is often translated as victory. It's the word Nike. It's kind of interesting that um, uh, Nike, you know, is a, uh, a manufacturer of running shoes and the implication is if you put them on you'll win the race you'll get the victory and that's what the word nike on it comes from the greek nike which means victory it's also kind of uh, translated as overcomer um, and so uh, what's interesting is throughout this book there's such an emphasis on victory and overcoming divine victory is seen in revelation over all the enemies of God. And so we said 15 out of the 28 references. So the majority uses of the Bible are found in this book. So it's a book of victory. It's, it's a book of conquering. In fact, uh, one uh, comment, commentary that I have, uh, and it's by a guy who's a millennial, <laughs> uh, William Hendrickson, but he's titled his commentary on revelation more than conquerors and it certainly is revealing this idea of conquering let's just we can just look at some of the references chapter 2 and verse 7 we read this it, it says he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith to the churches to him that overcometh or to him that gets the victory will i give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god and you've guessed it throughout these seven churches we've got the overcomer we see it again in verse 11 he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches he that overcometh he that gets the victory he that nikes so to speak uh, shall not be hurt of the second death so all the way through the seven churches is mentioned uh, and we'll point them out as we go but uh, look at chapter 5 and verse 5, we'll see another one here. It says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. That word prevailed, to open the book, to loose the seven seals. Guess what that word is? Nike, the one who has gotten the victory, the one who has overcome, the one who's prevailed. He has the right to. 
to open the book. Chapter 6 and verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, horse and he that sat on him had a, a bow and a crown was given him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, in this case, I believe it's speaking of the uh, the coming world ruler. And he's going to come in a very conquering fashion. And again, that's the word Nike, conquering and to conquer. And so, again, uh, he's going to have his, his day in the sunshine. He's going to have his moment of victory. But it's going to be short-lived. Chapter 11 and verse 7. Chapter 11 and verse 7. We read this. And when and then when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Speaking of the two witnesses. So the two witnesses are, are going to be overcome, conquered, it would seem, uh, by this man of sin. And we're going to be left with a question, who can stand against him? You see, he seems to be invincible. Now, can anybody stand up to this? Uh, this world ruler, verse 11 of chapter 12, it says they overcame him. How? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Uh, chapter 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So again, this world ruler. Uh, even uh, given power to overcome, but notice it's the powers given to him. Uh, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Divine permission allows him to have his day, as it were, in the sunshine. Chapter 15, verse 2, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, the tribulation martyrs, those that have gotten the victory. Chapter 15. Chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Then the final reference in this book to victory, to overcoming, is Revelation 21 and verse 7, where it says this, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And so we could say, book of revelation not just about prophecy oh yes it's about prophecy all right it is a prophecy but it's not just about end time events it's about christ it's an unveiling of christ a beautiful unveiling of christ but it's also a book about conflict and about victory and about overcoming and the overcoming life and how to be an overcomer and so, again, very practical. In fact, some have suggested that even though it's prophecy, it's very pastoral. There's a lot of good encouragements to live the life of an overcomer. So, chapter 1, in verses 1 through 3, we have the prologue of the book. And then in verses 4 through 9, we have an opening salutation. And then from verse 10 through 18, we have the vision of the glorified Christ. The prologue, the salutation, the vision of the glorified Christ. I want us to think uh, about this <clears throat> unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the word apocalypse. Um, in the Greek, this revelation, and again, it has the idea of unveiling, and it's it, it's the difference between apocalypsis is unveiling, apocrypha is something hidden. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, isn't it? You think of the apocrypha, it's something hidden. Uh, apocalypse is something unveiled or revealed. So it might be when a new car is about to be launched, 
and you'll see in the showroom and it's got over it a cloth and then when the moment arrives the cloth is pulled back and there's the unveiling of this new model uh, it, it, it might be uh, the unveiling of a new statue or something but in this book as it were god is pulling the cloth back and giving us a unveiling something god wants us to see and it's interesting that when we think of the book of daniel and Daniel chapter 12, let me just read a verse from Daniel chapter 12. We'll see that kind of Daniel ends with a decision to kind of seal things up and, and close things down and uh, put things from view. And so in Daniel 12 and verse 4, we read this interesting statement. It says, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall to and run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So it ends up with kind of a, a, a shutting up the words, a sealing of the book, even to the time of the end. Now we come to the time of the end, and what is God doing? He's not sealing things up. He's unveiling things. He's allowing us to get a true glimpse of things. And as I said, if we see everything else, if we see the beast and the false prophet and mystery Babylon, and miss Jesus, miss Christ, we've missed the point. He wants us to get our eyes primarily on the ultimate overcomer, the glorified risen Christ. In his first advent, there was, there was a veiling of his glory. Uh, I love the reference uh, in that great Wesley hymn, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. And so there was a veiling, uh, the, and particularly of the glory of the Lord Jesus uh, was, was, was veiled. It was just temporarily on the Mount of Transfiguration. We got a little bit of a glimpse, but in John 17, verse 5, we he, the, the prayer of the Lord Jesus, Now, O Father, glorify thou me, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. When we look at Revelation chapter 1, God is pulling the veil back, and he's getting us to see something of how that prayer has been answered and how the Lord Jesus has indeed been glorified. So here we have the unveiled Christ, the glorified Christ, a Christ in glory and and so he's the object of all divine revelation and so it's going to reveal him in all his glory now just quickly i want to think for a moment in just in closing um notice the phrase which god gave him there's kind of a passing of truth here revelation of jesus christ which god gave unto him to show to his servants which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. So we've got this kind of chain of, of revelation. God, the source, gives a revelation to him, that's to the Lord Jesus, to show to his servants. Now, how does he do that? Well, he gives it to his, his angel, and then he gives it to his servant, John, and then John passes it on to us. So God the source, and of course, we shouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, when Jesus was on earth, one of the things that he said on more than one occasion, but let's look at a couple of them, John 12, 49, he says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And then John 14 and verse 10, again, say, my dear, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. So, and then he, in turn, gives it to his angel. Su suggestions are made that the angel that then reveals to John these things is none other than Gabriel, who was involved in giving revelation to Daniel.
back in Daniel chapter 8, and then Revelation in chapter, uh, concerning the coming of Christ in Luke 1 and Luke 26 uh, to Zacharias and Mary. And so God, to Jesus Christ, to his angel, and then to his servant John, and then finally to his servants. And so that's how this book has come down to us. That's, as it were, the, the chain of command or the chain of communication that has been brought to us. And here we are on the precipice of looking at it together. But believe it or not, an hour has just passed and we better stop right there. But you can see we're going to be in for a great adventure as we consider the great overcomer, the Lord Jesus Christ. May that encourage our hearts as we begin this study. Amen.